Hospital Porter's Pride and Dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Hapangmo TV and welcome to this. A special video on cryonics. What is cryonics? Well, first of all I'll say it's quite interesting that I am making a video about cryonics because this is a subject that I've come back to. It was one of my interests from many years ago when I first started the original Hapangmo blog that I've kind of come back to. I've suddenly come back to and started exploring again. And I think that's very, very odd in a way, because my opinions on the subject have not changed. Yet, I found... I found the need to go and look at it again. To revisit it, to re-watch a lot of the videos I watched originally, read a lot of the articles I watched, read originally. It's kind of... It's a subconscious urge that's come about. And, um... I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I can probably hazard a guess it's to do with my experiences over the past year because I suppose th um, this is not unusual among people that mortality awareness occurs at certain points in people's lives and in my case the bereavements I've suffered over the last 12 months probably have put me in the mood where I want to contemplate mortality and if you don't know what cryonics is I will explain I will understand how it is it is centered on the, p the concept of mortality the bereavements me being, of course, Ian R. Crane and Gareth Davis, and, and even since then we've had Shirley Bolstock, who's also died. I didn't know her that well, but um, I did some, um, I did interview her a couple of times, and um, she gave me a medium re mediumship reading and things like that. Very, very um, good of her. She was a lovely lady. Um, has passed away, and I suppose this focuses a person's attention on on death and I think the the March for Life thing I did as well has also contributed to this new desire of mine to, ex to to go back to my intellectual roots as it were within the alternative field. If you want to read my stuff in cryonics go to the original Hapanmo blog, Hapanmo hyphen, uh, no it's just hapanmo.blogspot.co.uk and it's literally among the first articles I published back in like, 2007. But cry cryonics is the <clears throat> It is the. I'll, I'll give you the proper definition here. It's um, it's the storage of a human corpse, with the speculative hope that resurrection may be possible in the future. So basically, when someone dies, instead of just burying you or cremating you, they preserve the body. They not using normal embalming techniques. They preserve it using a special technique of putting it in a very very cold place, with the hope that. The, the kind of preservation is specifically geared towards preserving the brain and neurons and things like that in the hope that at some point in the future technology will emerge that allows you essentially to be resuscitated from that condition. Um, it's it's um, something that's it, the word um, the word actually is, comes from Greek, krios, which means cold, and it's often associated with ice. However, ice is the last thing you need. This is, this is the thing about cryonics. Ice is something you want to try and avoid in this sort of situation. And in fact, a lot of the cryopreservation techniques used to, to put a body into that state involve removing as much water from the corpse as possible so that when you do put them into a, into a very, into deep freeze, into a deep freeze state, you don't get ice because ice, um, ice does terrible damage. I mean, you've seen what it can do to a water pipe if you get a frozen water pipe. It bursts. Because ice, um, unusually among, among materials, water, actually expands when it cools and um, water the volume of water will increase by 11.1 percent I believe when it freezes and of course that means that if, it's, if you have a little bottle of water and it's completely full when you freeze it of course it's, it breaks the bottle apart if you try this with a glass bottle and you put it in your freezer you'll end up with a big glass a big lump of ice and broken glass all around it well that basically is what ice does to your, your body cells if you if you freeze a body, the body might look the same if it's just just frozen, put in it's just put in basically to, put in ice. But the ice crystals inside the body will have destroyed all the cells. It'll basically rip them apart. And so a lot of the cryopreservation that some um, cryonists do is geared towards preventing that from happening. I think this is going to be quite a long video actually because there's a lot to go through. Um, yeah, it's. It's something I've been thinking a lot about. I suppose 
like I said, my opinions on the subject haven't changed, but as I was saying, it's just simply the f this thing about mortality is just getting to me. It's really getting to me. Um, it's kind of a movement. There's these people called cryonicist, and there's a movement of of individuals. It's mostly American, actually. There are, there are others around the world, but it's primarily in the United States this is done. Um, they tend to be people who are non-religious, as well, obviously because if you're religious, you believe in a heaven, or an, um, and if you may believe in another form of afterlife, of some form or another, which I do, and I'll come back to that point. That's a very important point, actually. Um, however, there's a couple of Buddhists who are actually cry preserved. There's one Buddhist couple preserved their two-year-old girl um, when she died. It was very sad that. And um, so there's, there's there's a group of people who got together and decided that's what they're going to do when they die. They're going to cry and preserve their body at a very cold temperature in a special facility. And there are two actually within the United States, I believe. Although it says in Wikipedia there's a third one. I don't know which one that is. There used to be many, many more. They, they kind of they they kind of absorbed into two main ones. Um, there are two organisations of a similar size. One's the Cryonics Institute, uh, which was founded in 1976 by Robert Ettinger, called the, the so-called father of cryonics. He wrote a book called. The Prospect of Immortality in 1962, which kind of popularised the idea. And there's another one called Alcor, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, which is of a similar size. It's slightly older, formed, I think, 1973. And um, that's, that's basically the two are very similar. They're of a similar size and they do a similar sort of thing. There's a new one being formed, actually, in Russia called Cryorus. Um, Yes, there's a third one now outside the United States in Russia. Where else? So there are three locations, to my knowledge, where which provide this service. If you live in another country, then and you want to be cryopreserved, when you die, you have to you have to go to one of these three facilities. You have to sign up with one of them and go to one of them. And it's a good idea, actually, if you know you're on your last legs, just to head there, uh, head to somewhere close by. For example. Al, um, Alcor is in Scottsdale, Arizona, near Phoenix, and they have a hospice nearby. They've actually rented a room at a hospice, so you can spend your your last days there, and then you're very close to the, the Alcor facility when your time comes. Now, what's when you what happens if you're a coronacist when you die? And there's, there has to be a doctor present to pronounce present, pronounce you legally dead. And indeed, there's been a lot of problems with the cryonics movement over this. They, to getting the paperwork signed and making sure that everyone understands that person is actually dead before the before the, the chronicists come and take him away to the facility. There's been a couple of legal battles and in one case is arrests and criminal investigations of claims of, for example, um, what do they call it, premature euthanasia. So certainly, you know, people, for example, on the cryonics list, you're moving, maybe spent going to the Going close to the going close to the facility and then downing a few pills to try and speed the process along, or someone involved with the facility um, giving them medication to speed the process along of death in order to get them into the chronic facility, which of course is of course murder. If a doctor did that, I mean doctors have done that and they've been jailed for murder. Um, but no, it's um, there's a. Uh, there's a very very strict legal process to go through. I mean, the modern the modern institutions are actually quite good. They're actually quite. They, 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 all these experiences they've had over more than fifty years has taught them a lot of uh, the mistakes of the past. In fact, there's an article I've been reading which basically goes into the history of the mistakes made in the past. Some rather dodgy people got involved with it in the beginning. A guy called Robert Nelson, for example, I think that's his name. Um, yeah. Um, but it's. Uh, History. Here we go. Oops. It would be the idea of a freezing human cells. And it actually dates back to the 1950s. In 1954, thro frozen sperm was used to inseminate three women. I mean, that's that's something used regularly nowadays. You know, you can actually have a child without having sex, and um, you can, you know, through test tube methods or artificial insemination and stroke test tube methods. Um, and then the book, in 1962, the book Prospect of Immortality came up. In 1966, the first human body was frozen in, in liquid nitrogen. They used liquid nitrogen as this procedure. And then the first body, the first body to be cryopreserved, this is the first time this, in the modern sense it was done, um, in, there was a cryopreservation 
with the intent of preserving the body without ice crystals inside it because they, they, they thought that maybe the body could be resurrected in the, fu in the future was a guy called Dr. James Bedford, a guy from California. On the 12th of January 1967, um, within two hours of his death, he was a team turned up from a, a local group, Cryonic Society of California, led by a guy called Robert Nelson, who's now a he's now a, a pariah within the cryonics community because he was so incompetent. He actually had a vault set up at this place called Chatworth Cemetery, which is in Glendale, California. And the, the very word Chatsworth is kind of um, it, it's a, it's a it has horrible con connotations within this community. But um, he started the cryopreservation pr process on Dr. James Bedford two hours after he died. Now, um, the process is, is quite gruesome, actually. Um, it, as I say, it's been perfected over the years. There is a video, um, you can't get it on YouTube, it's actually only on one platform, where they actually, it's actually filmed in great detail. It's actually quite a sad video, because it, it covers the, the last days of this lady who's dying of cancer, and she wants, she wants the whole thing filmed. But um, basically, wherever you are on your deathbed, there's an ambulance outside and a team from the from the organisation of your choice will be there. <clears throat> as soon as you're, as soon as you've been, you're died, and the doctor has released the body, they take you into the ambulance, and first they actually drain the blood out of you as much as they can, and replace it with a temporary pres preservation fluid, and they also cool you down as much as you can with ice, dry ice, and they also give you some cardiopulmonary resuscitation so you have an in you're intubated you have like a, a breathing tube into your lungs which fills your lungs with air and ox oxygenated air sometimes um, enriched air and um, CPR is usually done it's not done manually now you may have learned to do CPR manually you know where you I was taught this I was one of the last porters that actually taught this where you have to press down on the person's chest manually that's, that's, it takes a lot of effort to do that there's a machine that does it now and I've seen it being used it's like a big pounding pile driver thing that goes boom, boom, boom onto your chest and they drive you to the facility once they get you to the facility again your body's getting colder and colder all the time they, don't, they only take you they only cool you to just above freezing they're very careful not to let you actually freeze at that point because there's still too much water inside you if, they, if you freeze at that point you'll get ice crystals inside your cells and, and that will ruin you ruin the body they then, and I say, what, if you've got a strong stomach, watch the video, but if it may not be for the squeamish, I'm an ex-hospital porter, these things don't bother me. But they then use a perfusion machine where they basically attach pipes to the main blood vessels leading from and to your heart. And they just remove the temporary, the, the, the remains of the blood and the temporary cryoprotection fluid and replace it with a vitrification fluid. This is something that then fills the entire body, including seeping into the cells. And once all that, once that has been done, then they can then lower your body below freezing temperature. In which case, the vitrification fluid, which I, I don't know what it's called, it's got a long, complicated now. I think it's a type of al alcohol-based solution. Uh, it's highly toxic, by the way. Don't try, don't try to do this on anyone alive. Um, it's um, it's then uh, you could you could tell actually they, they say that your the skin turns a kind of orange tint when this stuff is getting into your cells and they you can see this lady who you saw talking elsewhere in the film sort of alive and talking it's, it's very it's sad I mean they interview her husband as well it's very sad and um, once that then they put you into another box where they, over the course of five days they cool you down to I think about minus a hundred degrees and um, then you're removed from there into a temporary dewer, as they call it. A dewer is um, it's basically a, th um, a thermos flask for very, very cold temperature ingredients such as liquid gas. In this case, liquid nitrogen. Then they then put you in liquid nitrogen, which is minus 196 degrees. Uh, that's 77 Kelvin. That's just 77 degrees above absolute zero. For comparison, uh, the coldest temperatures at the South Pole ever recorded are about minus 85 is minus 196 much colder than that and then um, you they, they then put you in that for a while until, and for a few days until your you know, your your body you're put in this special container which is like a metal casing which has holes in it to allow the liquid nitrogen to flow in they wrap the body in a sleeping bag to provide extra insulation just in case because they have to lift you out of the temporary dewer into the permanent dewer 
and then they um, they cool the body down to minus 196. You put on your head just in case the levels of liquid nitrogen drop. drop. So your, your head, the most important part with your brain in, is always submerged in the liquid nitrogen. And, um, and then after I think a few days of that, when, when they're sure that you, the liquid nitrogen has, has cooled the body right down, they then lift you out of the temporary dewar and that's a, this is a bit this is a dodgy part of the operation it has to be done quickly because they have to lift it out and the body they have to they have to be careful that's at liquid nitrogen temperatures they don't want the body to thaw out and then they move it straight over to the permanent dewar which is like a big canister i'll put some illustrations in the titles um a big big dewar which is insulated full of liquid nitrogen you can have four people in there and in the in between the four Basically, the, you see the, the, the casings the people have put in like segmented. See, so there's like uh, you can see they're like designed to fit into a cylindrical container, but there's a gap in the middle, and that and in the gap they have like up to five smaller containers, and these are people's heads because some people just want their head frozen. These are called neuros. The technical is they just want their head frozen because they just want their brain frozen. The ideal being that when they're resurrected, the technology will exist through nanobots or whatever. To build you a new body to, for your DNA, because um, it is theoretically possible to restore, to take a person's, you know, to take a person's cell and clone you an entire new body. That's theoretically possible to clone an entire new body from just one of your cells. It could be a cell anywhere within your head, and they build you an entire new body and they stick your head on it. Who knows what the future will bring in terms of technology? Um, and then, and then you just sit there and wait until. And they, the job then of the institu institute is simply to keep you there. Um, just keep you there for however long it takes until that technology emerges, which who knows when that will be. Well, Russell, of course, already knows it, but he won't give it to us. <laughs> uh, but the question is, I suppose, no one knows how long that will be. I mean, when Dr. Bedford was cryopreserved in um, 1967, I don't know if, if he expected to be resurrected by 2021 I don't know what people made predictions people made I mean it was it was a big media sensation at the time when Dr Bedford was cryopreserved there was a Nelson this uh, this guy this who's um, who was a bit of a quack this guy he um, he wrote a book that we froze we froze the first guy you know things like that but it was it was like a there's like a lot of popularity over it um, lots of media it, and it became very very it became popular. A lot of people signed up. Now, like I said, there are only about fifteen hundred people signed up for this. It's not enormously popular. Not a lot of people want to do this. But um, this book was written. I've just been reading this actually. This was book. Was, this was book was published in nineteen sixty seven. It's a short novel, probably inspired by this particular story um, by Clifford Simak. Why call them back from heaven? Um, the idea of calling people back from heaven is an interesting idea. I'll, I'll actually may do a full review of this book actually. I'm about halfway through it. It's an interesting book actually. I've had it, I've had it for years. I bought it like about God knows 20 years ago. I've never read it until now. Um, but uh, I'll do a full review of that book at some point because that's like a science fiction book of the future which talks about a, a world in which they can actually revive people who are cry cryonically preserved. You may have seen uh, Woody Allen's film Sleeper as well. Um, in fact, the a lot of the production is a lot of the production design is based on the photographs taken of Dr. Bedford's um, what they used to call cryonic interment. It's now called cryonic preservation. Um, he was put in this big cylindrical cylindrical vat. This this dewar is um, horizontal, and he was like pu he was like pushed into it, wrapped it in what looks like tin foil. It's actually a thermal blanket. And that's when they put in the liquid. They they cooled him down and put in the liquid, liquid nitrogen. Uh, Woody Allen in the the film Sleeper. It's a very funny film. Woody Allen is a really good comedian. He's very funny. But um, Sleeper is actually quite an amusing film. He comes he comes out of this of this dewar wrapped in tin foil essentially. It's it's making a joke about the whole Doctor Benford thing. He's he comes out in the future and it's very very funny. It's it's a good film. It's a, it's a partly silent comedy, um, very, very amusing. If you've never seen that, I do recommend it. This guy, Robert Nelson, he, um, oh, he got sued. I mean, because he set up a company, Cryonic, Cryonic Society of California, 
and everyone this this ran from 1966 until 1973 when it was dissolved basically um, went bankrupt only one of the people I think 17 people were cryopreserved by this organization all but one of them the cryopreservation failed they, the body stored out and had to be disposed of in a conventional way uh, the only one surviving was the first ever Dr. Bedford and that's basically because um, as this article said that I, re I, I read um, this was an article by um, this guy called where is it it's an interesting article actually because um, he talked about what happened Mike Darwin of Alcor what happened is that basically Bedford once he was in it once he was in his dewer once he was cryopreserved the body he, they managed to get him away from Robert Nelson that's the only reason he survived they got the, 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 the actual relatives looked after him which is good which is a good thing you see a lot of the um, people who are cryopreserved not all their relatives are happy with it there's often court battles and some there's often court cases where some of the relatives want the, the person buried in a conventional manner um, there's contest, you know, wills are contested, things like that. Um, others, other, um, other members of the family battle to have the the body cryopreserved when another member doesn't want it. I mean, families suck, don't they? They really do. Um, this happened in recent years, actually. I covered this on her panel. Voice. A 14-year-old girl from Scotland who was cryopreserved when, when she died of cancer. Um, she she decided she wanted to have this done, and the the mother wanted was was with it, but the father wasn't. Um, there was a court battle and eventually it was, a, it was all agreed that she would be cryopreserved at her death and so she headed over to, to um, one of the she headed over to one of the facilities from Scotland and she, she went to the United States went into the hospice room and then died there and was put into cryopreservation um, what happened was the family of Dr Bedford actually looked after him they put the Dewar in their garage <laughs> And they had to order liquid nitrogen because these things don't require electricity to keep them cool. They're not like a fridge, which has like a, a it has a, like a catabatic cooling system with using comp you know, compressed gas and things like that. This is simply it's, it, the, the cooling system for these dewars is very simple. You just fill them. You just make sure they're full of the liquid nitrogen. This liquid gas, at 196 minus minus 196 degrees. You just make sure it stays at that temperature, and that's all you have to do. And what happens is the the gas slowly boils off. It's it warms up and it escapes through an for a safety valve. Um, how quickly that happens all depends on how good the insulation of the dewar is. And this one wasn't very good. It had it like a, a vacuum. It had like a um, it's it had several things. It had lots and lots of padding. It had like a vacuum jacket and things like that. However, the vacuum jacket leaked and eventually was broken, and more they needed more and more liquid nitrogen. And this guy, Mike Darwin from Alcor, rescued them eventually in 1971, and it was moved into a into a, a different cryonics institute in a part of Arizona, I believe, and then it went somewhere else. And all all the time, it was like moved around from pillar to post. Eventually, it went back to the family who had it in their garage. And Mike Darwin from, from from Alcor, he eventually rescued it. He rescued. He didn't know where it was because he this guy disappeared for a while. At Bedford, his his dewer just vanished. And no one knew where it was. Eventually, it was tracked down by Mike Darwin, and everyone thought that because this guy was the first ever cryopreserved person, everyone thought, well, he's probably been thawed out and buried by now. No one knew, but then they managed to find him, and he was back. He was back with the family in the garage again. And when Alcor came along and rescued them, I think by then it was 1977, and they, they, the family were completely out of money. They were about to just give up and say, ask, just get the undertakers to bury this guy and have a full funeral for him. And then Alcor took them off his hands and took them to their facility, which is where he's been ever since. Um, in 1982, Bedford was actually moved to the permanent Alcor facility, and then in, again in 2000. And, Three or so, I think it was uh, when when did Alcor move to the to the Scottsdale facility? I don't know. Alcor moved to their new facility. I think it was in the early two thousands. And um, Jack Bedford went there, and he's there to this day in one of the in one of the dewars. He was actually in nineteen ninety two. He was moved from his old horizontal dewar to the new state of the art vertical dewar. But while he was interestingly, there's an article describing him because 
there was a full medical examination of his body. They had to had to do it. In a, they had to do it very quickly so that he didn't thaw out. But they wanted to see what condition he was in. After all this time, after spending like what was it, fifteen years in in this, having been quite amateurishly cryopreserved, what what state would he be? And they found he was actually in quite a good condition. He was actually in quite good condition. Um, there was even some of the original ice on the outside of the body, which um, was still there, which meant that he hadn't thawed out. How much ice was inside him is a different matter, because if there was ice inside him, then he's he's going to be in big trouble. The body's going to be badly damaged. Um, yeah, um, just going through, I think it in my notes here. Yeah, the... The... There's all kinds of issues associated with this. There's a whole page here on ethics and things like that. Everyone goes into it with full consent. Everyone has to sign documents. They have to sign a will. They have to make a will. Um, and um, as I said, there's 1,500 people currently walking around today waiting for the opportunity, when, when their time comes, to enter this particular facility. Only one body is... Only, only Bedford is preserved from the first wave of cryopreservations, all the others have, have gone, it didn't work. Um, it was developed from orgo, organ preservation. This And it started off of course with single cells like the sperm in 1954 and then um, moved on to other things. Now, um, if you want to be cryopreserved, firstly, I mean if you want that, I mean I don't personally, um, I'll explain more about why I'm, I'm not I'm not going to participate in this myself. But if you want to be cryopreserved, you've got to sign up with one of these companies. The ones either in Russia, the one in Russia, CryoRus, or the Cryonics Institute, or Alcor in the United States. Apparently there's a fourth one, I don't know what it is, but according to Wikipedia there are four organisations that provide this service. There's actually a community around the people who sign up. It's like... Um, there's like a, a journal they publish, and they have conferences and things like that. So you can even you can even be a kind of like cryonicist and join the sort of cryonicist social life. You know, maybe they have a sports and social club, and they all uh, they you have coffin races and things like that. Sorry, that was naughty, up Ben. That was that was very very that was very facetious, Ben. Now, but people, there are people who make a joke out of this. Like, where, where's the? Let's have a look. Um, there's a very funny story actually. I've got to tell you. Where is it? Here we go. In the town of Nederland in Colorado, they every year they they have a festival called the Frozen Dead Guy Day, and that's because one of these early attempts at cryopreservation in the 60s, there was a guy from Norway who actually was cryopreserved, but it was done in a very very sort of rushed way. It wasn't planned beforehand. Um, he was cryopreserved, I can't remember the full story, but basically he was cryopreserved, just put in dry ice in Norway. They flew him over in a hurry to, this, to the relative's house in, in Nederland, and they ended, up, yet they ended up putting him in the garage, like putting him in the shed or the garage of the house. And eventually the local authorities came along, and there were laws, there were sort of bylaws in that particular locality, you can't keep dead bodies on the house, you have to... You have to get rid of them in one form or another and cryopreservation is not one of the ways and if you have cryopreservation you certainly can't do it on your own premises they said either you move this body to a proper cryopreservation facility or um, we're going to have to come in and, and get rid of it get the undertaker to take away cremation etc we'll, we'll give it a like proper disposal and the family there was I can't remember all the details but the family kicked up and eventually I think he was cryopreserved somewhere Proper, although he's, the body was in quite a bad state, so um, we don't know what will happen there. But um, every every year they ha they do have coffin races and things like that, and people dress up as zombies, and they t they generally have a good time as on Frozen Dead Guy Day. They've also got a bit of a dark sense of humour in this particular town. But you know what's uh, you got to laugh sometimes. I mean, this is this is typical of hospital people actually. You know, they often. Um, Doctors, nurses, porters, and other staff—you know—they develop quite a ghoulish sense of humour, because that's one of the ways you cope with this sort of thing. Um, 
If you want to be cryopreserved, it costs £80,000 to have your body cryopreserved. If you want just your neuro, that's a head. If you just want your head preserved, they cut your head off and put that in the liquid nitrogen. Um, then that is £10,000. And the way to pay for it, most people pay for it, is with a life insurance policy. Although they, this covers the, the cost of cryopreserving you and keeping you cryopreserved. And it's, some of the money is put into a trust fund in order to keep the facility going where basically it's there are uh, like stockbrokers and people like that and hedge funders who um, maintain it and who maintain the the income although they also have fees you have membership fees as well and if you work it out it, it's not a bad model when you consider there are about 250 dead bodies at the moment in preservation 1500 who are arranged to do it, who are, who are paid up members, when you, when you die you stop paying and you become the beneficiary. And it's the only life insurance policy actually where you do become the beneficiary because mostly the money goes to other people. But this in this case it goes to you. However the fees stop, the membership fees stop, so if all these 1500 people died at once financially these organisations would be in big trouble. And as you know, from, from the, from the organisations set up around the Chatsworth Cemetery, a lot of the reasons why these bodies thawed out was because the, the companies went bankrupt. And basically what happens is if any, if any company, if any um, cryopreservation company goes bankrupt, they simply, I don't know if, if they've made arrangements for insurance, or it may, they may have had an insurance scheme or something like that, but very often they simply return the body to the relatives. And the relatives then, if they want to keep the body cryopreserved, they have to fund it, which means, again, finding a facility where you can legally store a dead body and then paying for liquid nitrogen to be delivered from chemical companies. And then they're quite mean. I mean, the, the, with Bedford's relatives, when, you know, when the chemical company worked out what the liquid nitrogen was for at their house, they don't normally make deliveries to private premises. They started putting the price up, which is one of the reasons the family almost the family almost went bust caring for this dead body. There's this guy called Aubrey de Grey actually, who's he's a real character. He's got this big like Rasputin beard, and he speaks in this really posh sing-song voice. He does lectures on this sort of thing. He's a very good talker. He's going to have his his head frozen, although he probably will lose the beard. I don't think they'll let him keep that. But um, yeah, he hopes that in the future they'll they'll be able to revive him and clone him a new body and things like that. So yeah, uh, so this is all in aid. All this is in aid of what? It's in. It's all the purpose of cryo cryonics. Not, it's not cryogenics, cryogenics is something different, it's cryonics. People get involved in it because they don't want to, they're scared of death, they don't want to die and disappear. And so this is a form of secular afterlife. It, it really is. It's, it's a secular form of the same thing that religious and spiritual people do. For them, the way to immortality is through science. And because the science doesn't exist now, well, would you, they'll just preserve the body until it does. It may work. I mean, the the, the cryonic systems themselves, the, the the leaders of the organisations, they don't. The, and the the big names in the movement, they say there's no guarantee. They don't know it's going to work. It might not work. It could be that none of the bodies will be recoverable. Some of them might be. All of them might be. They don't know. Certainly not possible today. This book actually is all about what happens when it is possible. It's a very inter interesting book. I'll, like I said, I'll do a full review of this at some point. You can get, you get hold of a copy if you want. It's on Audible as well if you want to listen to it. Um, so the idea is that you, they will, through some process we don't yet have the technology for, that the body will be reanimated. And the da that's, not, that's not the only problem. They then have to repair the damage done by the cryopreservation and cure the original cause of death. So if it was cancer, they have to be able to cure the cancer. Like this lady, Anita, this, this Anita, this lady who was in this documentary, this lady I felt very, very, a lot of compassion for. Um, an old lady who had grandchildren who was dying and her husband who survived her and what he was saying and things like that. And he said, you know, he, he visits the facility and he... Um, he goes and 
gives the tank a hug where she, he knows exactly where she is within the tank and he sort of hugs that area it's very sad he even talks to her and people leave flowers and things and they put they put stickers on the sides of the dewars or pictures of the people or they put pictures of the family on the sides of the dewars it's it's extremely it's extremely touching and heartrending actually it really is The question is though, if is it possible to do that? Is it possible after someone has died to restore them? Now, funny enough, the Quranicists agree with the people who study near death experiences because they, they say, and they're correct actually, that the brain, even a, even an inactive brain, can be restored to full function. So um, if you have a cardiac arrest, the classic one is the cardiac arrest, where you do literally brain, brain activity just drops. Your brain literally shuts down. And the only reason you don't die is because the resuscitation manages to get your circulation going again in time to save the brain from permanent um, cellular death, which is the definition of death legally. I mean, it's, some people said, well, oh, I died on the operating table and came back. But no, no, you didn't die. When people ever, whenever anyone says that, they didn't really die. De death is a permanent state. They were in danger of dying. They almost died and were resuscitated. Um, now, technically, it's, it's possible that this whole cryopreservation thing is simply an extension of the resuscitation process. And that at the end of it, you'd be able to bring the body back to life restore circulation and then things will be back to normal however this is it's a very extreme form of that sort of thing what would you would you just simply continue as you were or would you be somebody else it's the, this is where we go into this whole area now an inactive brain there, there's examples of people who have been through an accidental natural cryopreservation in a way people who for example have fallen, fallen into freezing cold water now there's an in the um in this new netflix documentary which leslie kane produced um i think it's called uh finding the afterlife or something i can't remember i mean i, I have watched it i can't remember what it's called but um in that particular documentary they feature one woman who fell and was actually she was actually um brain she was actually her brain was inactive for about three quarters of an hour and her heart stopped for about three quarters of an hour yet she was brought out she was resuscitated she had no permanent brain damage and the reason is is this has happened a few times it's because the body is immersed into very into a very cold situation in this case very cold water bodies um people have been resuscitated successfully after successfully after 66 minutes of cardiac arrest now in normal circumstances that's impossible you can't you can't if if you if you're on the operating table and you go into cardiac arrest and you're being resuscitated there's no way they can keep working on you for 66 minutes because by that time it's too late usually you, it's about seven or eight minutes actually of oxygen starvation and the brain then is is, is beyond repair however this lady had an NDE this lady who was in the water other people who have completely inactive brains have NDEs is it possible that people in cryopreservation will simply have NDEs and then come back who knows and this really should make people think I mean a lot of the atheo skeptico materialists we should think about that. Now it's possible that because that a lot of them, a lot of them are people. So a lot of them who get into cryonics are the people who have rejected all other forms of afterlife. And but this is it's really weird because they're kind of people on the atheo skeptico materialo, atheo skeptico materialist side, who have in a sense forfeited their MBA. They're not going to get their materialist bravery award. So, see, most skeptics and atheoskeptics and materialists are not cryonicists because there are there are millions and millions of atheoskeptical materialists. Only fifteen hundred cryonicists. So, I think it's you, you can safely say that most of them don't go for it. And some of them just don't believe it's possible. Some of them just never really thought about it. Others, it's I think there is MBA is a motive for some of them, and they don't want to lose that MBA. And if you sign up for Chronics, you're essentially forfeiting your MBA. 
because you're not showing that you're not showing that bravery. Well, I describe in I'll put links in the description box to to the to the relevant publications I've made about MBA if you're unfamiliar with that concept. But um, you see, if your brain, you, you, this is bringing a brain back from say 500 years in liquid nitrogen is very different to restoring it after five minutes of cardiac arrest. You know, the inactivity would have been complete, even in a completely inactive brain. On, on when you go to cardiac arrest, there is a small amount of activity. I mean, it's been just, it's actually been monitored. There's this guy, this scientist, I can't remember his name. He's got a he's an Indian guy with a turban, but he has actually been doing monitoring, doing tests on. He used to be doing animal tests on rats that are brought close to death. He, he brings them close to death and monitors their brain activity. And even when they're in full cardiac arrest, there is a small amount of little tiny little blips of on the EEG or activity deep within the brain that can't be picked up by a surface EEG and indeed there was um there was a quite frightening article I heard that this had been discovered up to I think 15 minutes after death they discovered this I mean humans which means now now the thing is that the skeptics have tried to explain NDEs as this. They've said, well, that is your NDE. The NDEs are caused by this brain activity, which doesn't really make sense when you consider that NDEs are highly complex, they're highly lucid, um, they're very powerful and very, very vivid imagery. Now, your brain normally doesn't, your brain, an inactive brain can't do that. The only time your brain can do that is when you're either awake or you're having dreams. And your brain is very active when you're having dreams because it's essentially creating a complete. Um, Sort of virtual reality for you when you're asleep having dreams you know if, if you have a you can have very vivid dreams that are as real as real life how is that possible because your brain is, is working overtime to create it um, so that doesn't it doesn't explain why end it is but it just gives you a, an idea of what I'm talking about now with that those those deep brain blips which were discovered by this turban guy won't be present within a cryopreserved body. You, a cryopreserved body is literally a frozen piece of meat. Very, very deep, frozen at minus 196 degrees, without any water in, hopefully. Without any, completely dehydrated. If you're lucky, you get complete dehydration and no ice crystals. Um, so suppose how, and we don't know how they will bring them back, if they find a way. What would happen though, I mean, would that, when, if that brain was successfully restarted, what would it be like? Would it be you? Would it would it retain memory of the, the the previous life it had had? Because see, we don't know exactly how memory is in, it actually works. We know that we believe that um, I mean Stuart Hameroff and was and Roger Penrose are talking about. They believe it's connected to microtubules within the neurons, and it may have maybe some sort of quantum quantum computer effect. We don't know exactly. We don't know. For example, it's. The original idea was that different parts of the brain store different memories, and it would be like a kind of library. That your memory, there's actually a memory, there's a memory module within the brain, and it functions like a library. There's little cells store electrical patterns, patterns of um, which represent certain memories, in the same way that um, ink is preserved on the pages of a book. We well, you know that's not true because um, people who suffer brain damage often suffer memory loss. Amnesia is common, um, temporary or permanent amnesia. However, they can't take, they can't damage one bit of your brain and you forget your great uncle, and they damage another bit of your brain and you forget your grandmother. So your memories of your great uncle are stored here, memories of your grandmother are stored there. It doesn't work like that. And very often, no matter how bad amnesia gets, it some it can very often it can be recovered. Indeed, there's things I've forgotten. Sometimes dreams I forget, and then suddenly later in the day it'll all come back to me. And sometimes, you know, memories, you know, sometimes memories, I, f I forget memories. I, I, there's all kinds of things in my life I forget. And then suddenly, usually it's when I smell something or taste something, because these are very, very closely connected with memories. Suddenly, I'll get an entire cascade of old memories coming back to me. This actually happened to me yesterday. I actually was riding in someone's car because I had to take some... I had to take some garden waste through a rubbish dump, and this person drove me. Who this person's garden I was gardening in, 
and the, her car smelled the smell from within inside her car the smell of kind of like velvet and rubber and other things that cars smell of was exactly like the smell of my uncle's car when I was a kid and one moment I smelled it I suddenly thought of my uncle's car and I haven't thought about it for years so we don't exactly know how memory works which means a cryopreserved brain that is restored to function may well not have any memories of the life it was before now in that way, in some in some sense, would that would it still be you if if that brain had a consciousness? So when it was restored, the, the, a new body was cloned. If it was just a neuro or things like that, would would the brain therefore be still you, or would the consciousness be entirely different? Would it be an entirely new manifested consciousness? Which essentially means you would that that re re recovered body would be no more a continuation of your life than somebody else like someone born at that time we don't know and no no one knows the answer to this and the coronal system I think they're making a lot of assumptions about brain function they say oh no we, if we as long as we preserve the synapses and the neurons then we can get the brain going again and it'll be, it'll be pretty much like it was before we we estimate that memory will probably be the same we, we don't know that that's the thing we just don't know It would it would be a bit difficult to have, as well for people. I mean, um, supposing you could come back in five hundred years or something, they find a way to bring you back. You come back, they fix you up, you're living again, and it would be. I suppose it would be all right because if you if you had it would be a bit tricky. I mean, Woody Allen in the film Sleeper, you know, he, it's quite hilarious. He comes back into a, he comes back into a world two hundred years in the future, and he's like three hundred years in the future, and he's completely. It's the whole everything's transformed, and indeed you would find that you, you know, not just technologically things would be transformed, but culturally and, and psychologically, and everything would be different. And you'd be complete. You may well be alone if if your relatives who are also cryonicists also freeze themselves, like this lady Anita's husband. He's he's going to do that, and he said in his documentary he hopes a day will come when he'll be able to meet his wife again and. Because they'll both be they'll both be frozen, and then hopefully they'll both be recoverable. But it's possible that you know not not all your. I'm sure all these people have relatives that don't want to be cryonicized. But it's possible that you you not all your people who your loved ones who are also cryonicized will be recoverable. In which case you'll be alone in this new world, not knowing everyone. You'll you'll have to grieve the people you left behind. You have to make completely new friends. Funnily enough, um, on the subject of friendship, um, some of these companies also they also preserve pets. I mean, several dogs are also cryopreserved. There's some dog heads, um, but they have a policy actually that I think Alcor does. They will never, they never, they say they will never resurrect a dog unless the owner is resurrected too, because you know dogs, dogs feel it very bad because of the bond they have with their owners, which is very intense. It's um, it's more intense than most human bond, most human relationships, and they said it would, be, it would be cruel to bring a dog back and the owner's dead. I've actually known a, a lady who had a dog and she died, and the dog basically died of a broken heart. They had to well, well, the dog, the little dog called Phoebe, is a cute little Yorkshire Terrier. She wouldn't eat anything, she wouldn't drink, she wouldn't go out for a walk. She lost the will to live, and they had to euthanize her. Um. She died of a broken heart. Um, but really, it all comes down to <clears throat> it all comes down to again. This ties very much into the free will videos I've done. This idea of cryonics, because what could happen is what I suspect might happen is you'll get a you you get a fully functioning brain and the consciousness within it will be will be a different one in a sense it will be a different incarnation or um, it'll be a, what David Deutsch calls a consciousness zombie. Now David Deutsch is an interesting guy he's done some interviews with Sam Harris where they explore the limits of artificial intelligence and he said, he said to Sam Harris, they, they, seems to, they seem to be hitting a, a ceiling when it comes to developing artificial intelligence in how intelligent they can make it. And indeed, anyone who's lost a video to YouTube because they, 
they did something completely harmless that the algorithm thought was not knows this already are people scared these things are going to take over the world I don't think so you know a small child can outwit the best artificial intelligence with a capture code you know there's prove you're human what does this say how many motorbikes are in this collection of pictures you know, a, a, a five-year-old kid can outwit the world's best AI, AI in, in like that um, so no there's no danger of these things taking over the world um, What you could end up like is, is a, a functioning brain which has no consciousness. Is, is a zombie, is a con, is a a zombie twin. In other words, a human being which the with which the brain works, but the the consciousness is in, is disincarnate. So the consciousness has left. Whatever process normally happens when a, when somebody dies, and when you if you even if you can restore full brain function using the latest technology of the future the consciousness cannot be restored to that brain and you'll end up with essentially a robot something which is as in that book the soul of Anna Klein something which is alive in in terms of its biological functioning but it has no self-awareness it's interesting isn't it? it's an interesting thought I'd, I'd be curious to see if that would happen and the other alternative is of course you have there is a an, an eye there is a self-awareness to it, but it's completely different. Either because it's a different incarnated, if a different incarnated soul, or the soul itself, devoid of all memory, is no longer technically, on a philosophical level, the same person. Just imagine: Would you be the same person if every memory you had of your entire life was removed from you? Would you still be the same person? I think probably you know you would be. I think there is a, there is a kind of zero point of consciousness which exists even in the absence of all memory and indeed the, the, the consciousness of people like um, people like Anthony Peake and Mike, and Mike Chalmers and people like David Chalmers and people like that have come to that conclusion others such as Daniel Dennett are much more material they take a much more sort of reductionist line and Susan Blackmore kind of just simply parrots what Dennett says but um, yeah I think they would you either you would be a person Either you would be somebody without any memories, or you'd be, there would be no consciousness, and would, you'd have essentially a biological robot. The, other, the only other alternative is you would literally undergo a 500-year NDE with an inactive brain, and then come back as you were. That would be the best. That would be the best outcome, I hope. And you know, when I look at that, I, I felt enormously sad for the couple in this documentary. The documentary, incidentally, is called. Um, it's stranger than fiction death in the deep freeze you can only get it on one platform it's actually not on YouTube but I felt enormously um, I felt an enormous amount of compassion for this couple and um, the sentiments they expressed they essentially have forfeit their MBA they're looking for afterlife and science is the means by which to provide it because they I don't think they would they don't strike me as people who believe in the soul they're essentially atheo skeptico materialists and you know, I, I hope it all works out for them. I really, I hope it does. But as you know, I don't. I, if if you want to see someone, if someone dies who you love, you know, and the prospect of seeing them again exists anyway in a natural form. I am. Uh, I have not changed my mind on anything related to that sub this subject. Nothing in my renewed interest in cryonics has any real bearing on that. I don't think. I still believe as I do, based on my study of psych psychical research, there is a consciousness which is separate from the physical incarnation, and there's no reason to think that it's going to cease when the biological death occurs. I can't prove that. You know, it's, it's impossible. Even Peter Fenwick says it's not provable, but all the evidence seems to converge on that conclusion. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but. Um, but I'm not going to sign up for cryonics. I'm not. I'd be interested to know if any of you guys are thinking of doing it, you in the chat. I know some of you are atheo skeptical materialists, so um, let me know if you've thought about that. Um, I am not going to. Um, I'm, I'm an MBA basket case anyway, so I've got nothing to lose in that respect. But um, really, as I said, I can't prove that I won't simply vanish into oblivion at the moment of my death. I can't prove that. 
beyond any doubt at all. If I did, then it would be like The Discovery. Incidentally, this book reminds me of The Discovery a little bit. I'll, I'll say that, that film with Robert Redford, I'll say more about that if and when I review this. But, um, just put it this way, I am... I have enough confidence in this outcome to roll the dice and spend the £80,000 on something else. If I even had £80,000. See, it's academic. I mean, I, um, I could apply for life insurance, but basically I couldn't afford to cry preservation even if I wanted to. But if I had the money, I think I am confident enough to, to take my chances and simply spend the money on something else. The fact that I've come back to this particular subject is it's grim actually. It's grim. But it comes to, it happens to us all. I've I think I've already I've always had a base level awareness of mortality, probably more intense than most people because of my 23 years in hospital portering. You can't you can't avoid the facts of life in in that, in that kind of environment when you're inside those four walls. You you see a very different world to the one you see outside it where basically everything within those walls everything within those walls is essentially sealed off from the knowledge of people outside and you see you see that life to quote was it to quote um um to quote uh, thomas hobbes nasty brutish and short red in tooth and claw that's life and you see ending in the most appalling ways possible you see people with in, with injuries and illnesses which leave them in leave them in conditions that I I would not describe, I would not even describe to you and I don't like to think about. Either way, either you can, you can see why hospitals are so often haunted because as Dr. Mitchell Gibson was saying, you know, they, it's, it's, it's where people die, it's where there's pain, there's fear. It's no wonder there's so many ghosts there. And um, that's, uh, but my baseline level of mortality may, you know, uh, since I quit hospital portering, I've been, been 10 years nearly out of hospital portering. Um, the 6th of January is actually my 10th anniversary. Um, I'll be covering that in detail in a video at the time, probably a live stream or something. But um, the, the thing is, first Ian died, Ian R. Crane. And then Gareth Davis died, and Gareth, of course, was, I think it's fair to say, he was one of the, one of the people I think was closest to me. I mean, there's certain people within a, that are close to me, and there's my daughter, obviously. Um, as I said, I have, I have a very distant relationship with my father and brother. I, I, I love them, and they're my family, but I have a quite detached relationship with them. But there was my daughter I'm much closer to, and of course, um, um, my very close friends within this community, like Colin Wolford, uh, like Nick Collistrum, um, the other people you see me making films with, and it's appearing in my videos, there's them. And Gareth is one of those people. Gareth is a person I sp used to speak to, at, you know, every at least once a week for several hours at a time, sometimes more than once. And um, losing him so soon after Ian was it's had an effect on me, it really has which is still happening today. Ian R. Crane was a guy I knew, I met several times and spoke to a few times I wasn't close to him, I wasn't as close to him personally as I was to Gareth but I respected and admired what he did, he was enormously inspiring and he was normally, he was influential on me very very influential and he provided me with a lot of knowledge and a lot of a lot of inspiration and a lot of comfort and a sense, you know, that, that things weren't so bad and we can get out of this mess kind of thing, which has been essential for me. And losing Ian was a, was a big blow in that respect. You know, which is why I was so angry over the whole, about the, the horrible way that a certain person re reacted to Ian's death. Um, and Gareth, Gareth disappeared. I still can't quite believe he's gone, you know. I can't. I used to speak to him so often and he's gone. And this is what, and then the March for Life thing as well, I think. Has made me it made me aware of my own past, my own family history, which I describe in there, my own bereavement, which I suffered. Going on the march for life kind of brought that back, which I think eventually, almost inevitably, I could have predicted it led to my 
my renewed interest in the cryonics subject. And it's, it's, it's interesting to read those articles that I wrote 15 years ago or so. You know, it's 2006 I first started Hapan. I actually deleted a lot of the early ones and started again in 2007, but um, the articles now there date back to 2007. And it's interesting to read those articles now because I've suddenly started reading them again. I've rewatched that documentary and everything. So, yeah. Oh, funny, I watched, there were some old, there were some old YouTube videos that I must have watched back then at the time. And I saw some comments I posted like 12 years ago or something on these, on these YouTube videos I've been watching the last few days. Yeah. Uh, so, I'd be interested to know what you guys think about it. I'll, be, I'll probably do a video review of this book, actually. You know, and um, you know, if, if, if you guys show enough interest in the subject, uh, we'll do a live stream about it. But um, I'm interested to know what you will think about whether the Atheo Skeptico Materialo people, sorry, Atheo Materialo Skeptics, or whatever, Atheo Skeptico Materialists, or Materialo Skeptico Atheists. I don't know which is the best combination, but you know what I mean. You people who follow me, and I wondered it, what you think about all this, and those of you who don't, who actually are not atheist, skeptical materialists, what you think about it, let me know. In the meantime, um, let's hopefully my next video will be on a more cheerful subject. Thank you for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital Porters, pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order.